अनर्थम अनर्थम there was a lot of a very healthy dialogue we had the last session just want to capture all those thoughts so that we don't misunderstand nor do we develop, develop a wrong perception to the concept even though the text says the wealth is calamity wealth along with everything else in life is a neutral factor wealth per se is not good or bad is neither positive nor negative it all depends on how you relate to it is like saying marriage is disastrous you can't say that i heard more than once i've come across many people especially the younger generation they are afraid of getting into a a marriage getting into a a commitment of a, a relationship because their perception of people living with marriage is only disharmony conflict friction so their perception to it is negative but you can't brand marriage as disharmony you can't perceive it that way so we are not supposed to look at wealth from a negative perspective please so it all depends on um, how you relate to it now one of the important aspects we we misunderstand or mistake is that every human being is essentially i repeat every human being is an essential composition of these two factors which is the material quotient and spiritual quotient so every human has and needs to have these two aspects so one cannot live without the other is like i have the there's a if i if i had to cut my personality into half there is the left side and the right side the two sides of my personality you know even my physicality and so dissect my physical body there's left side of my body and the right side of my body so i need these two parts as it were to come together to to make me who i am so materiality and spirituality are two essential elements in every human being and these both are independent factors so materiality is not dependent on spirituality spirituality is not dependent on materiality they are two independent angas two independent elements in a human person's life so when you look at these two elements what we realize in in most people i wouldn't say not even many in most people there is an imbalance in fact i would say 99.99 recurring there's an imbalance in this spiritual and material personalities in within is like my my right arm is more stronger than my left arm you know my right side of my body is more strong than the left side of my body there's an imbalance so i am almost limping because there's a certain strength and weakness so there is an imbalance there are independent factors both are essential elements but the fact of life today is there is an imbalance now material quotient is described by uh, uh the the quantum of your wealth 
And as we have said, wealth or materiality is that which can be transacted with anything gross and tangible. So with wealth, you can buy sense objects, things, amenities and facilities for yourself. So that's what wealth can buy. So your wealth is measured by what you can exchange it with money. It can be in, in the form of physical wealth, gross cash or wealth in your accounts and digits, or it's something which you have traded in for something else. It could be property, it could be whatever. But that is the material side and a spiritual quotient is measured by how contented you are. If you want to make it easy to understand, just making it very simple terms, your spiritual quotient is measured by how contented you are. As I've said, these are independent factors. Irrespective of how wealthy you are, that has no measure to how contented you can be. Now, the three possibilities. You may find, you will find, many people are material rich, but spiritually poor. Many are material rich, spiritually poor, but they're not contented with all what they have, with all that what money has bought for them. They always find themselves discontented, unhappy, wanting for more. So material rich, spiritually poor. Second class of people, there are a minority of people are materially poor, but spiritually rich. They are high in values. They have very high level of detachment, but they don't have the material wealth, even to advance a cause that they believe in. I, let's say I could be a very highly detached person, but I don't have the resources. I don't have the capacity to advance my knowledge, to reach out to people, to serve, to fulfill a, a vision. So they are just limiting it to themselves because they're not able to advance it because in order to advance the good, the good you want to do, you need the vehicle. So they, they, they lack the material vehicle, but they have the spiritual wisdom, a small minority of people. But an ideal state is, an ideal uh, state is where you are materially rich and spiritually rich. This is an ideal state. Majority are materially rich, spiritually poor, Second is there some are spiritually rich, materially poor. And last ideal state is both materially and spiritually are sound. Just to compare it with an example, I, many people are great orators, the great speakers, but they don't have stuff. They just blabber, they don't have any substantial wisdom to part, but they just keep talking and talking and talking. One class of people. Second class of people is they are people who are very wise, very sound wisdom, but they lack the art of communicating. They have the knowledge, but they can't, they don't have the vehicle to communicate. One class of people, they have the talent to communicate, great orators, great language, but they lack the substance, no wisdom. It's a rarity you find to have people with substance and the capacity to deliver. What I'm trying to say is you will find this unique possibilities in every aspect of life, not just related to wealth, you'll find in every aspect of life. It's just a matter of applying and finding a relevance how you want to bracket these three possibilities, the three categories. So it applies to wealth as well. So both should be high. What does it mean? You should have the capacity. You should have the capacity to advance your material quotient. You should also have the capacity to advance your spiritual quotient. I'm talking of an ideal state. 
If I were to keep surviving and living on what I have acquired, I'm, I just become a consumer, isn't it? I become a liability. I'm no more a producer. And the moment you stop producing, you, you, you're living a life of inaction, isn't it? So at the material level, one should constantly strive to keep producing. This is different to being greedy or avaricious. At the material level, you must embark on a life of action. So Vedanta, the fundamental principles of Vedanta is that you must lead a life of action. So when you're active, you are producing. Wherever there is movement, there's energy, isn't it? Water flowing, there's energy. Wind blowing is energy. When your actions are oriented, when you perform dynamic action, there's energy. And that energy should generate resources. It's not necessarily in means of wealth, please, but wherever there is action, there's life. Life thrives on the principle of action. So materially also, you must continue to produce through your life of action. That's why I'm saying there's nothing wrong with wealth, please. Produce through your action. So materially, you must be high. And spiritually, you must ensure you're contented. So what should you do? You ensure that you are reducing your needs and your desires. I am materially, physically active that my ability to produce increases. I'm constantly producing. At the same time, I'm constantly reducing my needs. This is a rarity, a very rare phenomenon, a very rare combination where you see wisdom in action. When you put this wisdom into action, you will find you are producing at the same time your needs reduces. So you're far more contended. So spiritually you're advancing. Materially you're also creating the vehicle or the resources to serve the cause or the work you believe in. You're not acquiring for your own selfish purposes, but you need the material resources to, to serve the cause, isn't it? I need a vehicle. Remember, it's a tool. Without the tool, I'll fall into the second category. I may be spiritually well equipped, but I don't have the vehicle or resources. So I'm just containing this knowledge to a handful of people. I'm just limiting it to a small pocket. What is the use of this wisdom if this is not taken globally, if this is not there to serve mankind at large? You must have the resources and the tool. So you ask me, I, I envision it. I have that perception how the works should, will reach to a large spectrum of people. There has to be that vehicle. There has to be that system. There has to be something set in motion that it will reach and fulfill its objective, but not for your own selfish purposes, please. I hope you all are following. Where you are materially advancing at the same time, spiritual advancing. Now, I'll just give this concept through a certain combination of percentages. As I've said, both are independent factors, but your spiritual development vis-a-vis -vis your material requirement are inversely proportional. Please write that down. Please note it down. Your spiritual development vis-a-vis -vis the requirement of the world, the material requirement are inversely proportional. So let's say if I'm 10% developed, spiritually I'm 10% developed, I would need 90% of the world to, to keep me happy. Am I right? I am 10% developed, I need 
90% of the world to keep me just happy, just keep me calm. But taking a stock of my life, I only have 50% of the world, world with me. Let's say I only have 40% of the world with me. Sriniji, just to get the percentages right. What would you say, sir, so far? Pranam Guruji. Namaskar, uh, sir. I think you basically said 90% and 10% is way humans are conducting themselves in the material versus spiritual, whereas spiritual. it has to be the other way. Yeah. Fair enough. Right. So if I am 10% developed, just a, a arbitrary uh, for discussion, you are 90% dependent, means you need 90% resource of the world to keep you going, which means you must have a secure job, you must have a healthy bank balance, your family has to be well, you have a chauffeur-driven car for you, you have a chauffeur-driven car for your family, and you have every six months you have an exotic holiday, you will have a, a, a holiday home somewhere, you have a, a, a palacious house, you have a lovely social circle, you will have membership in the illustrious clubs, you are connected to the this and who and whatnot, all this must be there just to keep you going. If any one factor you come to know that your job is being in focus. Instantly, it causes a lot of jitters. It causes a lot of restlessness. Hmm. So any one factor goes off, you're off balance. You're dependent for your peace of mind. But the reality is you only have 40% of the world, but you need 90%, you have 40%. The deficit is, sir, 50%. That 50% is described as hell on earth. That is the definition of hell. Hell is minus 50%. You want the world, you don't have it. The deficit is hell. The hell is where you keep desiring, you don't have it. The mental agitations and the trauma you go through is self-inflicted. This is hell. But just to flip the, the proportions, you are 80% developed. Your need drops to? 20%. Yeah. 20%. So what's the surplus? There shouldn't be a surplus. You're 80% spiritually. So you technically have 80% excess, you put another way. You don't need the 80% of material wealth requirement. No, no. You're you, content with 20 you're content with 20, but, but let's say you have 60% of the wealth with you. Let's say you only need 20%. Okay. means you're very happy going by public transport, hmm? but you have a chauffeur driven car there. You're happy living in a rental place, but you have a, a small two bedroom apartment fully paid for. But you are happy, content, living in a, in a more small rented apartment, mentally, but you have. So you need 20%, but you have 60% of the wealth. So what is the surplus? 40%, that is haven. Everything in life is a spillover for you. Now, again, I'm saying materiality and spirituality are two essential ingredients in every stage of your life. You can't live one without the other. Don't give me the stories that spirituality is good enough. Nor do you make me believe that materiality is good enough. You cannot live one without the other. They're integral parts of your life. You want to feed yourself. You want to, you want to be exposed to nature. Don't you want to have a uh, 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 something to cover yourself with. Don't, don't take extreme examples of great men and say they are rishis who lived in the in the in the in the jungles, in the in the in the valleys, in the mountains. But don't talk of them. They are not uh, the ordinary. We are talking of this dharma, this truth, which is a universal principle applicable to everybody. So this is where it strikes a chord. So increase your ability to produce, reduce your desires at the same time. So I am materially advancing. 
at the same time i'm spiritually advancing isn't it that's a rarity all clear so far is it possible can i ask a question yes sir please is it possible that i mean obviously from this context every human being has their own quotient levels right yes. so it depends on what you so you can have different levels of material and spiritual balances yes and it would change over time yes yeah it is not a it's not a static factor these keep evolving and changing depends on how you have adapted to life and how you have enriched yourself in life in general and these two elements in particular because these two elements are essential ingredients of a life what you were 30 years ago or 40 years ago when you when you started your corporate career or your professional career to vis a vis what you are now is poles apart isn't it what was your yes. spiritual isn't isn't it true but the point i'm trying to get across here is uh, what does the vedanta tell us i mean it, there is a very similar argument that was made by a very famous uh, scientist called maslow right it was called the maslow's hierarchy so it effectively mirrors this this concept that you have you basically have your basic needs fulfilled social needs fulfilled then you reach a concept called the self actualization which is the top yes. of the pyramid right right yes so i'm trying to say the equal the equalized model in the vedanta is of self actualization is the balance of material and spiritual quotient but it starts with the foundation of human beings require basic needs and basic social needs as the hierarchy to be fulfilled which therefore almost contradicts the fact that you're saying okay if i have basic needs the example you said is you need shelter which is a basic need you can't be thrown into the into the cold nature right um so therefore you need a basic four walls now i i get the argument saying you need one room or 50 rooms that's a, that's a that's a material difference but the start is you need shelter and you need basics to feed yourself and your immediate family if you're married which therefore gets you into the quest of material acquisition and that becomes a rat race and for you to hold on to that you got to perform more in today's world so what is the way that they teach you in this how do you strike the balance at every level so, at start level till you become at, independent see very pertinent observation but vedanta gives a very crystal clear answer from the wisdom it is uh, standing on the wisdom is its foundation there's a difference between a rajasic action and a sattvic action you must we have always pointed out the difference rajasic action is driven for self gratification self aggrandizement to gratify your own personal interests such actions will only create an imbalance between your material quotient and spiritual quotient i repeat rajasic actions only create an imbalance between your material quotient and spiritual quotient how is it rajasic actions is feeding your desires your desires on the rise and a rajasic mind is never contented because it wants more so that is not a solution to find an equilibrium between the your your material and spiritual but how do you strike a chord and set a balance between material and spiritual is performing sattvic action and what is the difference between sattvic and rajasic action action being the same it is what that drives you to act when your actions are driven inspired to serve a cause beyond yourself actions become sacrificial 
actions become pure, actions become auspicious. And such actions, where there is action, there is production. And by bringing in this higher element, your actions become more pure, your actions become more industrious. So the quality of action you're performing is of a higher nature. Remember that. Vis-a-vis -vis an action performed with selfish motives are always inferior nature with an action performed with an inspired nature to serve a cause beyond yourself. So the action itself produces because you're more productive, you're more industrious, you're more efficient. Your action resonates with the team, with the cause, it produces results. So it advances your material growth. You become an asset, not a liability, sir. A taker is always a liability. A giver is always an asset, wherever you go. I'm sure you'll agree to that. So if yeah. you are a contributor to any growth of an organization, the growth will never want to let go of you. So they are willing to pay any price to have you. Not that you're putting a price on your post, but they don't want to let go of you because they know you are a rarity because givers are far few number than takers. Even in an organization, you find very few are truly sacrificing in the interest of the organization. So that action, that quality of action speaks for itself. So it produces at the same time, sattvic action curbs and puts a lid on your selfish interests. So your mind is far more contented and peaceful. So sattvic action increases your material quotient increases your spiritual quotient. So the quality and the nature of action must be of sattvic and sacrificial nature from the very beginning. If you are working with that spirit, you will strike a, an apt balance between the two. Does that resonate, sir? Yep. There's a lot of parallels to business world exactly in the same, exactly what you're saying, yeah. It is, it has to be because this is the truth. And the irony of it is, this is what the Shastras are saying. It's not contrary, so it's something which is applicable to people from all walks of life. It's not just to a few selected bracket of people. It's not just for a handful of us who are sitting and discussing this text at this hour of the day. It is meant for people in every bo boardroom, in every organization, every employee must get these principles ingrained in them so that it brings that element out and it gives them a perfect balance within. Isn't it? So if I believe in this idea, I must also have the vehicle to serve this idea, isn't it? I am not just content by serving a handful of you all. My goal is very lofty. No point merely having the goal in my mind and not having the vehicle to serve its cause. So there has to be a balance between your material quotient and the spiritual quotient. But material quotient is not to gratify your own selfish interests. Your intention is very clear. The policy is a very sound policy, which is to serve the larger cause. Then wealth is not a calamity. If you relate with it well, wealth is never a calamity. Wealth becomes goddess Lakshmi, it's worshipped. But the moment you don't use it with the right intention, you start abusing it, it becomes a calamity. Therefore, I said wealth is neutral. But wealth is an essential element in one's life. You can't live without the other, nor can you live without the spiritual element. So it's all lopsided personalities. And this must be set into motion when? From the very beginning. Not midway during the course of your life. So even, you know, one of the most important things they keep in mind when they start loading a cargo ship. A cargo ship perhaps has, I think, I don't know, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 containers huge cargo ships. You know, one of the most important thing they keep in mind when they start loading at the, at the port, RPG, any idea?
Hariyom Guruji. Hariyom Sir. I mean, the only thing I can think of is that they want to load first whatever they're going to take off last. I mean, <laughs> just from a logistics perspective, right? So I, I, don't, I don't know the if that is the answer you're looking to receive, but but no. to me that, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, since you said that, I'm immediately commenting. That's not the yeah. answer I'm looking for. Yeah. I don't have anything else to offer. Don't say that. You disappoint me first thing in the morning. <laughs> it's evening. It's been a long day. <laughs> okay. Forgiven for that. Uh, Harish, before you get to ask what you wanted to, do you know the answer? Sorry, I'm Guruji. Um, I'm going to make an educated guess, Guruji. Um, I think they're going to look at the total weight of the ship as to how smooth or how efficient it will, it will sail. That's my guess. I think it's called the curb weight. Is it what they call? It? Yeah, okay. that is there is the dead weight. Yeah. How much? How much every ship has a certain weight. How much it can hold? Obviously, yes. But one of the most important thing is how well is the weight balanced in the ship. One of the more every time the container is loaded, that is constantly being checked. The balance of the load, which is spread out in the entire ship. Imagine if the entire weight. Even though the containers are all evened out, but if the, the net weight is tilted towards the left side, the ship is going to certainly sink. It's going to be, and further adding to the, the uneven waves of the crests and the troughs of the ocean is going to completely dislodge it, completely put you off balance. So when they are loading the containers in the, in the port, they make sure it's all balanced. The weight is evenly distributed, front, back, left, right. Everything is apart from what is the dead weight it can take, and that's the context with which I was asking RPG. It's not the logistic part that you know that which has to go last is loaded first. That that these certainly common sense, but even sometimes even we miss that, don't we? Right. But the context was on this. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes, Harish. Please, you wanted to say something. Yes, Guruji. Um when you were discussing the three possibilities of the different classes of people, um, they did not mention uh, materially poor and spiritually poor. Is there any particular reason why that category was is not mentioned uh, out of those? I mean, I was just wondering. Oversight. So please forgive me for that. Thank you, Harish. I'll have to pin it down. I shall. <laughs> no, just one break. That's one. No, you, 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 you would. They are literally the dead class of people. They don't really exist. No, inaction is death, sir. It's like talking about people who are in the deathbed. Uh, what you may say when it's how long would you want to drag along? You know, it's not good for you for anybody around. You know, so it's like you are on ventilators. That kind of a life. That's a spiritual ventilator. If you're neither spiritually developed nor materially developed, you're neither here nor there. At least be one place, be established. So worst thing is you're neither here nor there. So therefore, I didn't consider it's worth worthy of talking about it. But since you mentioned of it, let's all take a note of it. Okay, Harish? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, RPG. And then I'll come to GB Rao. Sorry, sir. Just a minute, GB Rao, Garu. Yes, RPG. So I had a bit of a, I had the same question as, as Harish G had, but kind of a follow up to that, that there's the thought of sort of mediocre, you know, kind of in the middle, spiritually, middle, materially, you know, there's that, it doesn't seem like you'd end up perfectly, you know, rich and rich and poor and rich, but a lot of us fall in the middle. Right, we're on a path. We have a certain amount of 
material wealth or whatever it might be. What what is is there any significance to that in in, in this context, or is that just a it, it doesn't it doesn't you can't really derive any meaning from it in, in this context of what Harish said. No, no. Arishi's uh, question was, you know, what about poor materially, poor spiritually, spiritually right? Yeah, yeah. And then the the other extreme was rich materially, rich spirit. But what about in the middle, <laughs> where most of us probably find ourselves, right? And, and you know, you look across the the world. We we have some perhaps some level of spirituality. We have some level of materiality. Is there any significance of that being in the middle? Which is what is ideal state we're talking, both is balanced. I don't know anything other than that. Well, no, you said ideal state was materially rich, spiritually rich. But that right? is degree, that's degree, isn't it? Okay, I see. It's a degree. It can that that principle can not that doesn't necessarily mean you are you have to be a perfect human being on earth. No. I see. Okay. I I I have laid emphasis on both these ingredients in my life. So I have attempted to enrich myself spiritually. I have led a life of sattvic action, so it has provided for my material well-being as well. <clears throat> But that's a, you can that you can be at twenty percent, you can be sixty percent, you can be hundred percent. That's degree is different. We all are. Let's say let's if we all are belonging to that ideal category. All of us are differing in degree, but all of us belong to the same kind. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Yes. Right. Clear. Thank you. Right. Jibig Rao Garu. Om Guruji. Hari Om sir. The, the true knowledge itself is the one who has to earn money. He has to have uh, most of the Rajasik people, they think that with the money, wealth, money, it brings everything. That is, uh, you can buy everything. That belief, the Rajasik people. So go on, acquire, they don't uh, allow to uh, go to others. Whereas the people who has understand that money cannot buy the truly then only it is a possible for the people to acquire is not going to disturb them the, the main focus is they think that suk santosh anand shanti bhadrata all this they think that you know only with the money is possible that is uh, to the extent is okay but the not uh, that cannot even uh, when you are that bad you have a huge amount of money, hundreds of doctors, you know, and everything is available, but your life you cannot save. That truly, if you understand, the money is not the, which you cannot buy many things, but Absolutely. comforts is okay. To that, they, those are the people, Sattvic, they do the extent of growing money is for them, is always better, like a knife giving to the a doctor or the vegetables cutting is always safe, but not the thief or the decoit to reach that knife. Correct. <laughs> very true. Very true. Namaskar. Very so, true. Tam Tamasik also is the one, he doesn't have the both. <laughs> he is just the consume, consume. That is his job is only to consume. So, Correct. Very true. Very true, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Namaskar. Yeah. Namaskar, Namaskar. Yes, Ji. Hari Om Guruji. Uh, this, uh, you elaborated on this 50-50, uh, you know, uh, ideal uh, state of uh, uh, this thing, wherein you, are, you also create resources parallelly uh, and uh, in a sattvic way. Um, so my question is, this 50-50 uh, balance, does it apply to all age groups and uh, their uh, higher goals, the status of higher goal? If one, one's uh, goal is uh, self-realization, 
and uh, he is in the uh, older age where he has uh, this thing now see we have also seen we all uh, all through life we struggle to raise uh, improve uh, wealth then we also find it difficult to protect and difficult to disburse more than the ultimate is so if one uh, is engaged in many pursuits at a older age in addition one is uh, giving another is uh, raising resources and another is spiritually uh, advancing i think uh, i personally feel it uh, it all depends on the capacity of the person but it will do it will do disturb see if he is contented this contentment is a uh, status irrespective of you and he is contented and his wants are decreasing and his uh, needs are uh, getting uh, minimized and uh, i feel uh, he should uh, uh, if he is focusing more on giving and also spiritually advancing uh, then this case of uh, raising personal wealth resources by satvik way uh, uh, because the moment you get into the habit of uh, raising resources at a uh, uh, there is no limit to it but it will definitely greed will peep in and uh, you will also get diverted and you can't totally focus on uh spirituality i'm just saying whether this can be taken as a general equation for uh, this can be i i feel it is good for uh, middle aged and uh, people who have uh, no no i i i don't think it is qualified by age or status or position it is the principle that's important the moment you say if you are embarking on action and that action develops greed that means your value systems or satvik quotient is less see your spirituality should influence your materiality your materiality should help you advance your spirituality there has to be an ideal relationship in this the next point i was going to say is the other each should help the other so your spiritual caution should help you to protect you from developing a greed and the wealth you produce should help you to advance the good you believe in this is an ideal state so when we say balance in both means action is the common denominator in both isn't it sir you would agree you would continue to act you should perform your swadharma whatever your swadharma is you should perform that swadharmic actions but for what you are doing that constantly changes so the moment you say if i am active and greed comes in that means you have already slipped in rajasic action so what protects you from slipping into rajas is your satvik koshan if you are firmly established in satva it will not allow you to slip it's like you are firmly grounded a person who is not grounded can slip any time so this is an ideal combination where you must continue to produce you must live a life of 100 years in the isha vasya upanishad says you must live a shata samah he says live a 100 years performing karma kurvanne veh karma ne jiji vishay shata gu samah very soon we'll get into the isha vasya upanishad you'll learn there sir you know just to chant the mantra in the way in the intonation it should be chanted it says kurvan neveh karma ani jiji vishe chataku samaah evam tvainanyate to asti na karma lipyate nare and he says asurya namate loka andhe na tamasa vrata the first mantra he gives you the path of renunciation ishavasya midagam sarvam yatkinchat jagatyam jagatena tyaktena bhunjitha magridha tasya siddhanam he says why are you quoting others wealth may you enjoy through renunciation if you are at that level of renunciation practice it if you can't practice renunciation he says 
Kurvannevehe Karmani. Perform action. Shatak Samaha. Live a life of performing action for 100 years. He says. What retirement are you talking of action, sir? And when the Shastras, when the Shastras talk of action, they only talk of Sattvic action. Rajasic action doesn't exist in their dictionary. So the moment you are slipping into Rajas or greed, inject Sattva into your action. I am talking of uh, Guruji, Sattvic action, I am so, very much for action. But should he indulge only in raising resources? He can uh, be in seva. He can uh, uh, fully in, uh, involved in activity. I am, when we say action, you do the necessary steps to ensure your goals are met. Let's say, sir, your goal is to feed as many people as possible. You need the resources to feed, isn't it? Or would you just, how, what good is of the thought of wanting to feed without having the resources to feed? So when your actions are to raise resources so that the, the poor and the needy are fed and provided for, isn't the action sattvic nature? You're not trying to acquire to increase your financial balance. That is not the objective. Your actions are towards the goal of meeting its objective. That is not rajasic action, it is sattvic action. That's what the Shastras are saying. Otherwise, you please tell me, sir, how would you fulfill the desire or the goal to feed the poor? How would you achieve that? Without action, how would you achieve it? Could you tell me, sir, please? See, you you can do put your own uh, resources as well as there are uh, without asking resources will pour in if you are doing for a good cause because there there are many who have money who want to give it for a cause but they want some others to perform that action they they don't have their focus is on uh, raising their resources so Sir, just be, just because when I say action. Just because when I say raise resources doesn't mean you keep knocking at doors of people and say, give me, give me. You will mobilize a team which will make it facilitate for you. You may not have to necessarily do that. But you have created an avenue or a vehicle to that happen. You will plan, you will, you will, you, you are the thinker. You may not be the actor, but yet you are instrument for every action that's happening. You get what I'm saying, sir. I know you are able to relate to what I'm saying. But you, sir, what I'm trying to say is I can just have this knowledge. I can keep this knowledge to myself and give it to people, those who need it, and, and that could be it. Or in the next 30, 40 years of my life, I hope I have that much time. If it's a little short also, I'll gracefully accept whatever is left in my life. But if my goal is to reach out this knowledge, not just contain to these walls or within myself, I should have a system in place that it has to have a roadmap towards that objective, isn't it, sir? But I have to be firmly grounded in the knowledge, in the wisdom. Therefore, I said, there's no point only having this without having the vehicle to serve its cause. There's no point having a sound vehicle without having even a successory. Many institutions have collapsed without having a, a successor to their huge empire they've created, empire. But there's no wisdom, there's no substance. So an ideal combination is you have a lofty, goal and the vehicle to, to, to serve the lofty goal and not one being compromised for the other. So when you're acting, your wisdom is not compromised. When you're seeking wisdom, action is not compromised. It, and if one is killing the other, that means the quality of wisdom or the quality of action is improper. You fall into the rajasic category. I'm talking of ideal state, sattvic state is, action and 
efficiency are maintained. So what's the point if a train which is just traveling at 100 kilometers hour is safe. And the moment the train hits the speed of 170, 150, 200 kilometers, every time the, hay, the train hits the speed, the train gets derailed or gets, gets into some malfunction and there's a disaster. Would you recommend that increase of speed to 150, sir? That means something wrong in the action. But yet you and I know Today, trains travel close to 500 kilometers with zero accidents. If you take a totality, the accident percentage is hardly point, point not, not, not percent. So they're talking of efficiency and safety at the same time. And this is what I'm talking about. But it is a rarity, I'm saying. So even in the time we are talking of the great Adi Shankaracharya, even his times, Adi Shankaracharya, at his age, he traveled the length and breadth of country on foot and bullock cart 14 times. He could have just sat under a tree. He could have sat under a, a small institution or a small hut and he could have just lived his life. At the age of 31, by that age, he traveled the length and breadth of country 14 times. And here is a man of astounding wisdom. What is the necessity for him to go pillar to post taking the te teaching this knowledge? And if we are not inspired by the guru whom we are learning his text, we are not imbibing what we are learning. It is no point having this wisdom and sitting under a tree or trying to be inactive. It has to be dynamically rolled on without any anxiety. There is no anxiety, nor is there any karma phala. There is nothing. He just went about challenging everybody across his path, spreading the, the great truth. Thanks to his efforts, we have the wisdom where you and I can discuss. Just for a moment, just glimpse into the life of the great Adi Shankaracharya. What wisdom he had and what vehicle he created so that that knowledge can be passed on through tradition. So many ages, eons have gone by. You and I still have access to knowledge because he created a parampara, a tradition, a lineage of the great Shankara cult. Thanks to his efforts, thanks to the action, but never ever the action was diluted his wisdom. The wisdom was contained in every action. And that is what is the balance does. When you have the wisdom trickling into action, your action resonates the wisdom, the actions become auspicious. But the moment the, sat the sattvic quotient or the, the wisdom is lapsing, then action becomes Rajasik, then it becomes an impediment. That's what I said to Sriniji. Uh, if you perform Rajasik action, action becomes impoverished. You will not be contented. It's a vicious cycle. Then you're going to rat race, as he said. But if you perform Sattvic action, you will be produced for the larger good and you will remain contented. You will reduce your selfishness. You will spiritually rise. So you're killing two, two, two birds in one shot. You achieve material progress, you also achieve uh, spiritual enlightenment. I bow down, I surrender to the life of Adi Shankaracharya. I think um, that's, that's, that if, if we can just take his image and say, what was this man? Oh, my God, that's it. That, that gives uh, uh, enough food for thought for us, Setuji. Not that I know you're not differing or disagreeing is just a point of thought for further deliberation and thanks to you the fact that you clarified uh, it concluded with the great example of Adi Shankaracharya I can't think of any better example than him can't think of a better example right sir but we can't try to emulate any particular personality please don't try to say uh, don't try to emulate a life of a Mah Mahatma don't compare and say oh Ramana Maharishi ji was, was he's just silent he just lived in Tirunamalai. He is a great Mahatma. Yes. Now, are we to never ever copy a lifestyle of a master? You must follow the principles and teachings. The teachings never say that you must adopt this path. The, these are the principles. That was his persona. That was his personality. That can't be mistaken as a path to salvation. Not many fit into that caliber of what the great Ramana was. 
So don't mistakenly follow his footsteps by what he did and believe you will reach that state. It might not fit me for certain. I do not know about you all. And yet, I, I may invoke his blessings every day, but I would not lead the life he led because that's not my dharma. They're two different things. Only thing I'll say is the more I talk, the more I'm convinced of it. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, and the arguments are only getting you firmly grounded in these principles. Hariji? <clears throat> it reminds me of Swami Vivekananda when a few boys went to him for spiritual uh, study, he said, you first go and play football in the ground and then come back. So, which was, he was very clearly telling that physically we have to make use of our body, mind and intellect to the 100%. Then only we can be spiritual. Just like what uh, you were talking about uh, uh, Bhagavan uh, Adi Shankara. They were all physically going up and down. Yeah. He told yeah. the students, you go play football and then come back. Correct. It's, it's, action is never ever uh, compromised. compromised. Never compromised. Inaction is death. You should never ever, in the name of spirituality, you should never abandon action, which is what people have mistook this, this the text the, the, the truth is misunderstood because they believe spirituality is more designed for those who lead an inactive life. It is not so. In fact, the spirituality is thrives where there is action. Gita says, what, yes, sir. Gita says that we cannot even live one second without action. Inaction nahi, is death. Nahi kashtit kshanam api jat yeah. is death. death. Even for a split second, you can't yeah. remain without action. Kshanamapi. Right. Perfect. Thank you, Ji. Ramji, all good? Namaste, Guruji. Yes, all clear. <clears throat> I think uh, <clears throat> we come across many examples in life uh, who have uh, operated at different percentages of material and, uh, uh, you know, spiritual quotients. And um, we learn from them uh, that uh, how to live or how not to live. Both the things we can learn from others. I think those examples are there. I know a friend of mine who was uh, the top guy in HSBC Bank in Bombay. And um, he used to live in a luxurious apartment given by the company with a luxurious, uh, mm, uh, you know, Mercedes car. But uh, on a Sunday, he used to walk out to the best BST bus in front of his house, get into the bus, go to his uh, guru who was in uh, King's, King Circle and play Veena. I mean, he was, uh, he learned Veena from him. And again, get into the bus and come back. So I asked him, why do you do this? He said, that car and that thing is all for official purposes. It's not for my personal. I still feel very happy sitting in BST bus, going and playing Vena at my guru's feet. Right. So, so I think there are people who have uh, who do that uh, type of uh, you know matured way of handling uh, wealth and. Uh, physical things that you have. I think detachment is a very important thing when you uh, when you accumulate these things and using them for good purposes is a very important thing. So that I think there are examples and we have, I've known people who are exactly the opposite also. So I think <laughs> the world is full of such people. Very interesting. Examples and references. 
yeah appreciate that thank you thank you i think uh, before i come to venkat raman ji i think kamal ji you wanted to comment something i thought i saw you raising a hand earlier yeah i just uh, just thought came to my mind i wanted to share that when we talked about sattvic action what i feel is sattvic action is when our we have developed the purity of mind when we develop the purity of mind through our habits uh then sattvic habits then only we move from tamasic to rasic to the sattvic thoughts and the thoughts in our mind drive our actions so it's our habits day to day habits which we need to focus first and even like you mentioned about gita uh we all the time uh, we are doing some action action is not only physical any thought or any our thinking is also considered as an action and in fact gita lists uh, probably i think in chapter 16 or that some chapter list 26 characteristics of sadhaka the habits you can develop and even in ashtavakra gita they list only five habits when king janaka asked uh, ashtavakra uh, saint ashtavakra uh, he lists five habits but all of them appear to be like maybe physical but they all are mentally related you know because that's where our actions are driven from so i think sattvic actions are there but they are result of our purification of our mind which comes our sattvic habits we develop and we do in day to day our actions those things and once we develop those habits then only our actions will become more sattvic from rajasi right absolutely perfect yes ji yes it's your sattvic state of mind that influences the action you right very true very true thank you ji venkatraman ji good morning uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, see in the current uh, business world there is a shifting uh, continuum of various business models okay that that are difficult to distinguish between sattvic and non sattvic between acquiring wealth to good means to not very good means being spiritual not being spiritual let me lay down a few examples okay one is the way of doing service you are an individual you go and feed poor you go and give something for the bird you pray you meditate that is an individual you want to do a lot more of it you start an ngo you take money from others you put your own money uh, seto raman is doing deaf uh, children thing you do it as an ngo okay then you find that people are misusing your good intention because you know they are just coming they don't need it but they are coming and eating free food and going so they have an ability to do it so you decide that you will still continue doing this but you now charge some money because you don't want to drain your resources okay you charge some money but you still doing social good okay i just then there is a this that when you do public health public good services like what i am doing where we organize marathons running training everything but you feel that whoever comes must pay money because we have an employee we have an organization we have this is another this is called social entrepreneurship where you are an entrepreneur you earn money but you are doing social good you do no social harm by your business so for example we go green we we reuse our corrugated paper we don't uh, use plastic in our runs exact example okay this then there is the business that is mature completely commercial but does a lot of good things for example tata is a very good example they didn't wait for the laws before the maternity act to come in they gave maternity leave you know they gave medical benefits even when there was no law to give medical benefits as an example you know this there is also this thing about governance and corporate governance where they say the company should be ethical it should not do any harm it should be sattvic but in management terms they use that you know and then and then there is csr which is you know compulsory and because it is compulsory company is going give it out and do some good so there is a whole range of uh, business models uh, you know going from the individual doing good teaching pravachan you know feeding birds whatever you know whatever good is doing to companies that are doing csr because it is compulsory to do csr so where does one draw the line between sattvic and not sattvic is there a question sir for me yes i am seeking a clarification 
in the modern okay. business world how does one determine that one is leaving according to the teachings of shankara as propounded in the bhagavad gita see uh, what is justifies what justifies your <clears throat> your action is your intention correct just because you have an inability to execute or you may have no vehicle or you may not be able to uh, effectively translate the action but what supports that inability or inability to do so is your intention so when your intentions are pure as kamal ji said when you are your what makes your action satvik is your mind and intention pure and that you know you know to what extent there is malice you know to what extent there is uh, an attachment you know to what extent there is a possessiveness towards your creation i could do something and i can be very possessive about it it's my way of doing or i could be very egoistic about it or i can be doing it to gain some name or fame or popularity or something out there for myself as long as that intention is not pure it spoils it for if it is impure it will spoil it if you are pure in the intention and if you put an effort to translate that into action it invariably produces results it depends on how grand the thought is in order to see i am envisioning that this knowledge should become a global thought process i am thinking grand i may fall well short of it but i am not thinking anything short of grand i am thinking in that sense there's no harm i can say oh i just want to serve this knowledge to the local community so the intention is pure auspicious the action has a loftier and loftier goal and as you are able to think high you know one of the things that always uh, comes to my mind is you should never think small think big nothing nothing there's no harm in thinking big i don't want to think small even with my spiritual goal i keep saying other day yesterday's class i think i was mentioning you were not there sir but i was mentioning that i want to think big in terms of spiritual goal i want to think of self realization and having dreamt of that i want when i say i want the goal is that it should not just be contained to a handful it should spread out the wings and soar high so that this knowledge reaches as many people as possible and all what will justify that is your intention so in answer to your question sir doesn't matter which system you follow where you fall in the bracket as long as the intentions are pure and you translate those intentions to actions your inability also to justify it with the intention but you were not content with mere intention please oh i i i i wish to serve but you're not doing any service i would still categorize you as selfish fellow no oh, you are not you should go out onto the field and serve man if you genuinely want to serve go out and serve then there may be obstacles or reasons why you can't serve then you understood like john milton when he wrote that famous poem on his blindness the sonnet he he wrote that after he became blind and in that he complains and he concludes at the end of it he says they also serve who stand and wait because he loses his ability to write poetry anymore but he says the fact that i have this genuine intention to serve even i also i'm serving who stand and wait because i'm not able to do it because i've lost my ability but he was always so what matters is intention backed by action and i am the best judge what my intention is so are you the best judge so look within and and purify that that motive make it as pure as possible hope that clarifies sir yes it does thank you very much thank you thank you uh, ram ji so uh, i think that's a very good question uh, mr akitaman has asked because in corporate world uh, we have many types of uh, companies and many types of players so i always look them look at them in three categories one is those who comply with the law because the law is there for everything and there are companies who are responsible to comply with the law there is a the minimum requirement and while doing that also people do a lot of uh, 
you know, cutting the corners and then uh, like CSR he mentioned, I know companies who have their own uh, foundations uh, floated by their nephews and then they give money to that foundation and then they funnel it back to themselves. You know, that kind of things is also possible. So those who comply with the law is number one. The next higher level is those who follow ethical practices because all legally compliant companies are not necessarily ethical, right? So those who make an effort to be ethical in their operations is the next level. And the third level is those who go beyond, then they work for higher purpose. There also, I think um, it is difficult to measure, but there are like he mentioned some uh, groups who, who do things which are beyond uh, even ethically required standards. And uh, one of the measurements that companies use nowadays is the triple bottom line approach. The triple bottom line actually measures your contribution towards. Um, so you are not only making profits, but what is your contribution towards people, your uh, the earth, the environment, and things like that. Your carbon footprints and various things which are not necessarily uh, legal or uh, ethical, but uh, ethically required. But uh, you might go beyond them and then do certain things. I think this the sattvic levels keep going up as you go from one to the other to the highest level is when you go for higher purposes and uh, do it with a purpose of service and sacrifice. I think that is the way I would look at it. But uh, what he asked is very relevant, that it's very difficult to classify companies or businesses into some of these categories. Correct. Thank you, Ramji. Yes. Uh, here, Eddie Garu. So, Pranam Guruji. Yes, I, I uh, echo the sentiments of Ramji and as well as uh, Venkat Raman. And I think the ultimately the current corporate world is uh, uh, with respect to the sattvic actions. I think is nowhere existing. Uh, I I don't I really come across anybody who's uh, with the intentions of Sattvic and doing their businesses. And without just quoting uh, name of any, one of the topmost uh, company existing in India, where we have been uh, closely associated in the last couple of years, I could see their, uh, their actions. They do a lot of uh, illegal mining. I mean, the coal mining in the deep in the forest. And official records says 10 and 90 percent is unofficial. And in the intent, in the present to the world, when they go into the CSR programs or they're going to be any uh, advocating to the world, they adopted few villages across of each habitation of not more than 1,000 to 1,500 people. Say so all villages put together, maybe around a population of 10,000. And they promote that. That's what they are developing to those villages, and they are enriching the lives of those villages. But they don't really uh, known to the not known to the world the amount of degrading is taking place to the environment. So here, if you really look at that, the intentions are absolutely in the wrong side of the uh, line of action there, because presenting to the world is something, and what actions are happening is uh, totally in an opposite. Like we talk about trying to do a 99% of wrong things and uh, doing one thing of 1% uh, right thing and advocating that 1% is equivalent to 99% as just to self-satisfy them or to misguide the whole world. That I could see, not that this is in a benchmark, but I think majority of the corporate world are uh, rajasic in nature, no, nowhere near to the sattvic thinking, uh, sattvic thought process. That, that's what my uh, views to be expressed in this forum. I wouldn't uh, differ with you. It's that's your experience and observation. I think there's, a, there's so much truth in that because uh, uh, the Shastras uh, very clearly say that wealth is no wonder. They say the wealth is calamity. If everybody were using wealth for the larger good, then he would not have used it as a calamity, isn't it, sir? Yes. The fact that it is an instrument for one's own spiritual degradation and downfall, therefore, there's a caution for all of us to stand up and take note. If he had not put it, we would not be 
examining this in such detail, isn't it? And what you said only reiterates the truth. So what was relevant then is far more relevant today, perhaps, than then those days. Because yes. the society was far more sattvic during his times than what it is today. So it, it, it needs to be reiterated, it needs to be examined, and it needs to be revisited because uh, I wanted to categorize, um, as I've started by saying, wealth is neither good nor bad. So the, the one I wanted to connect is how um, one can enhance the other. So how can your spirituality enhance materiality and how materiality can enhance spirituality depends on how you relate with wealth. So wealth can become negative or wealth can become positive depends on how you relate with it. I'm afraid I don't have the time to put all of it in one thought. So I will be forced to revisit this two words. <clears throat> Ushama. With your permission, I'll have to revisit again next week, ma'am. Namaste, Guruji. Yeah, it needs a lot of uh, a contemplation and discussion. So we will we will have to run into the, the fourth week. Huh? Many more Is weeks, it? perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so the word artham anartham has to be unfolded. I, I, because I, I had prepared this thought so that it comes across, but then uh, it is, I find it very important to, to get your views and your feedback as well so that, you know, we take a different perspective. So before I conclude, Hariji, yes, something to say, sir, please. <clears throat> Guruji, with uh, my little bit of experience in the corporate world, I feel uh, the Western corporate uh, world, the companies and the organization, though they are not uh, directly involved in Vedantic thoughts, but indirectly, they are very much involved in the, 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 the operational philosophy and method is much more Vedantic than our Indian corporate world. The corruption is less the efficiency is more, both physical, mental, and utilization of the energy within the eight hours of work is much more than the Indian. I mean, today they are also coming down where they are following some other path. But otherwise, the very reason for their material success is due to their Vedantic way of working. This is my experience. I may be wrong. Even in the modern uh, management courses, whether it is IIM or in Harvard or I don't know, Stanford, wherever you go now, indirectly they are, they are stealing the Vedantic thought and they are trying to infuse that in the management studies. Old wine in new bottle. They give some other uh, terminology, but it is all Vedantic thought. But I want old wine and old bottle, sir. Yeah. Can we think why the Western uh, material world or the corporate world is more successful than the Indian corporate world? We Indians, when we go there in the Western world, in abroad, we work much more than what we do in India. I, I have stayed almost 25 years out of India. I'm now talking out of my own experience. I'm not uh, making a general statement out of, without experience. In my experience, we, when, when, when we had to deal with uh, a European or an American company, the whole dealing was much more easier than if we had to deal with an Indian company. The moment it is in India or China or the Eastern world, then um, uh, we have to take it in a totally different way. The dealing with an Indian or a Chinese company will be different. It is much easier to deal with very straightforward what they are talking 
and they will be doing. Whereas when we deal with Indian corporate, what we are talking and what we are doing, they are 180% opposite. It is much easier to deal with the Western uh, corporate world. What could be the reason? That's why I also experienced sir. It's very easy to deal, to talk to Sriniji or Arpiji than Hariji. You know? I also have this experience. Because it's straightforward, I can talk to Arpiji or uh, Kamalji or uh, Sriniji. But I, I'm not able to talk straightforward to you. I don't know why. This is the problem. Now you have spelled it out. What, Sriniji? Do you agree with me? It's touche. <laughs> no. In fact, uh, uh, you're, you're actually right. Uh, I bow down to your experience. And uh, in fact, the great Ramatirtha, he puts it so succinctly. He says, the Western countries are applying Vedanta at the material yes. level. Yes, yes. yes. I, I, Therefore, I they have... To... Huh? I may like to slightly disagree. I mean, that's a very broad... And now it is different. I, I have made my... It is... It, it, off late, they are also following the Eastern exactly. path. I think... Yes, uh, that also I have Yeah, okay, good. I mean, come, I mean, I also worked in India and then obviously I worked, I led 80, 90 countries, but that's... And I, I, I think I still felt that the organization in India, I was very fortunate that I worked for is probably one of the best organizations I've ever worked for. It was highly principled and it's one of the largest multinationals and we were very ethical. We were well ahead of what most companies were, are doing even today. I mean, I'm talking 40 years ago, about 35, 40 years ago, you know, so it's a, it's a, I, the generalization I get, I think successful organizations if you have to lead and attract talent and people, you have to do more than just material. You have to lead, people use various buzzwords. Um, you know, you lead with purpose or, you know, ESG is today is what I think uh, uh, Mr. Venkatraman was saying, uh, is, is now mandated almost as a requirement for companies to have an ESG metric, which is environment, social and governance, right? Which covers CSR basically. So there is, it's just, it's just evolution that people say, hey, I got to do more than what uh, I'm, I'm in what, whatever business line you are in. So organizations thrive. I mean, even in India, despite all the constraints in India, I think we had great companies even, you know, Tata was a great example. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that you can see it if you go to Tata Nagar. They are, most of them are so, they are very, 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 very peaceful. You know? They have no fear of, uh, of anything because their life is totally taken care of till they breathe their last, whether hospitalization or whatever it may be. Yes, true. Whether it is Tata or Birla, but they are all exceptions in Indian corporate world. You can't, uh, you can't say that all corporate uh, Indian companies are like Tata's. That is why Tata and Birla's are more steady than other corporate world. People Hariji, will die so because I, think... I come from a family where most of my people have worked uh, for Tata's and lived in Tata Nagar. They will die for Tata. I think with all the experience which I completely lack, it's my paradharma, you know. I've never worked in any company all my <laughs> life, so I feel a little incompetent to talk. All I can say is whoever wherever irrespective of east or west irrespective of institutions or names and banners if these principles become the foundation and are ingrained in your system they will prove the test of time and they become relatively eternal because that's the principles that uh, should drive any 
they, they these are the engines of any progression whether be it uh, to create harmony within the workforce whether you you gain that trust or whether you build that integrity into your workforce or create enough success and materiality these two uh, are the material and the spiritual questions we're talking about even in the corporate sector you inject it so these values have to be ingrained and one who has implemented them as your experience and uh, references uh, have uh, endorsed that it works it's there for for everybody to be seen whether you have the eye to see it or not you know but what we are getting into is these principles have to be ingrained so whatever position you hold wherever you are it's essential you become a role model and inject these principles directly or indirectly by being a role model indirectly and being an influencer as a leader to so that the workforce uh, embrace these principles you know and thereafter you're that way you're impacting uh, your organization and society at large okay uh, lastly the question is you are asking any role model or example of materially wealthy becoming self realized soul uh, it's difficult to take an example sir because uh, I've, i've i've mentioned of uh, adi shankaracharya himself you know uh, a man who lived a life of dynamic action who created a vehicle who created an institution which which still continues to live and thrive even way beyond uh, his era uh, and yet he was a man of realization you know so uh, it's not question of taking examples just to understand and believe in this sound principle of the policy which we are talking about you know and once you are able to look at this you are able to uh, see people who have uh, lived that exalted life you know but the principle is sound this is what we got to surrender don't try to fit in the concept into examples understand the concept and then you will be able to uh, relate to it okay sir I, as i've said i will have to uh, revisit this so please be patient next class okay om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnamevavashishyate om shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Guru Namah Hari Om.